So today in, in my home studio, I have Luis Moreno, and I'm so excited to have him here today. He, I met him a, about, about six months to a year ago, and I am so intrigued by him. He is a Harvard trained medical doctor turned entrepreneur. Um, he went to medical school and is now running various businesses. And I'm excited to bring his story to my listeners because it's just very interesting. And um, he has a lot, I think, that he can share with our community. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is hard to get. He's very disciplined. He he had to meet at 5 a.m., just joking, 8 a.m. <laughs> on a Sunday. But um, he's very busy, so I'm just really happy to have you here. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. And yeah, sorry about uh, <laughs> the difficulty in trying to get here. Um, but, you know, the three kids and the business keeps me quite um, regimented. Right. And there's also the occasional golf game. Right. How often do you play golf? <laughs> um, I play golf about maybe twice a week. Oh, okay. Twice a week. Yeah. In the morning or and the afternoon? Whenever I can sneak away. Right. To do it, yeah. That's good. I, I, I'm going to talk about that because it's important for entrepreneurs to have fun and relax yes. and not stress out. So it's good to hear that you do that. Mm -hmm, I agree. So Luis, tell me about your childhood and how you grew up. Okay. So um, my, my mom, she emigrated to the United States from Puerto Rico uh, when she was about 14. And my dad had been here earlier. He's... Uh, emigrated from the Dominican Republic and they met at a nightclub. He was a security guard and they fell in love, decided to um, get married and, and pop me out. So uh, here I am. And uh, are you an only child? I am an only child. So their, their marriage, unfortunately only lasted a couple of years. And uh, during that time, um, so I was born in New York city, but then my mom and I, we moved to Los Angeles and then we came back to New York city uh, when my mom uh, got a divorce uh, because all the rest of the family was in New York. And so she needed the extra social support to raise a toddler. And uh, unfortunately there was, uh, I was really susceptible to croup in New York city. So then, um, we moved back to LA for the warmer weather. And uh, that's where we remained for um, a long time. And it was, uh, it was, it was great. You know, it's just my, my mom and I, um, you know, she didn't, I didn't feel that I was missing anything, but you know, when I look back, I realized there was a lot of, um, a lot of sacrifices that she made. There was, uh, you know, we pretty much lived in studio apartments in LA, uh, pretty much gang infested areas. Um, and there was a lot of different, um, avenues that I could have turned to, uh, you know, there were, there were times when I saw my, you know, when I, I vandalized things when I was a little kid, I was probably like six or seven and eight and just starting with early van vandalism, you know, uh, writing on the walls and tagging, um, which is not the person who I am today, but it just shows you what the environment can do to you. Um, and, uh, my mom, she made about a hundred and she made $220 a month at that time. And, um, rent was $120 and um, I'm sorry, she made $280. Rent was $120 and then another $100 went to private school. So she was adamant that even though she didn't have the money that she would send me to private school. Wow. And uh, yeah, so so the balance of that um, 60 bucks, let's say, um, was used for the bus pass for the both of us. And, uh, for food where she would regularly cook and eat my leftovers. And, uh, that's just how we lived. And it seemed pretty normal to me. Um, was it weird in your neighborhood that you're in a gang infested neighborhood, but you're being bused to private school? Was that hard with? Well, you know, it, it didn't feel well. The, the private school wasn't like these amazing, gorgeous, uh, private schools that you see today with these gorgeous campuses and the staff and these Ivy league walls. It was uh, out of a trailer actually. And it was this Austrian couple. Um, they were older. Um, I don't know what their backstory is. I would love to find out. Uh, and they ended up getting a trailer around, uh, on Alvarado, uh, in Koreatown. And, uh, 
they decided to provide private education for, um, you know, lower socioeconomic groups primarily. And so, uh, by the time I was finished with the fourth grade, I had a, uh, I had enough knowledge to compete in the eighth grade. So I was ahead two years when I finally went to regular school. I went to public school. So I was ahead by two years. So you moved into public school at fifth grade. At fifth grade. And it was, it felt like a joke, honestly, because I felt like I saw this material three years ago. So, um, ended up, you know, fast forwarding, graduating high school at 16, you know, so, and I owed it all to all of the, uh, the, the work ethic and, um, you know, the difficulty of the private school from kindergarten to fourth grade. That's why I'm such a stickler at that age. And my young girls, much to their chagrin, I have an eight-year-old, three-year-old and a two-year-old girl. Um, they, you know, they do homework every day, even on the weekends, because that's how I was. And I think it led to a lot of my success. So you are really a big advocate of education. Yeah, that's the only, that's the only difference um, in my life. My mom has six brothers and sisters and they all have, you know, several children and, um, nobody graduated from college, you know, and, um, nobody has, um, nobody makes any significant income. Let's just put it that way. Um, and there is some government dependence, a, a fair amount of that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm such an outlier, but I'm related. I'm the same genetic material. Uh, but it's literally a decision that my mom made to send me to private school and instill a work ethic when she received a lot of criticism from her sisters and family members and from her husband at the, at the time, her ex-husband, um, thinking that she was spending too much money on my education, that she needed to spend this money elsewhere, but she had a vision, you know, and she said, no, we're going to do things differently with this, with my son. And it completely panned out. So you're 16 and you yeah. go to college. Yes. Where, undergrad. Where, where do you go? Well, um, I went to UCLA and, uh, so you're 16 going to UCLA. Well, no, I turned 17. Like, oh, that, okay, like 17. that summer. Exactly. So, um, uh, yeah. So I went to UCLA on, um, let me see. Well, Reber what year Hall. was this? So this would be 1987. Okay. And yeah, I was born in 70. Um, and, uh, that was, that was very, it seemed like it was going to be easy going to college because the class demand seemed a lot less. You know, there were only like two or three classes that you would go to a day instead of uh, five or six classes that you would have in high school. But the classes are so much more demanding as any, um, if you're listening to this and you're going to head into college, <laughs> pretty much your GPA drops by an entire point, you know, uh, from high school to college uh, during that freshman year. That's the average. Mm. At least that's what it was back back then. And, uh, so the same thing happened to me, but it was also tough because I had to work full time during that time. And we were going through, my mom had remarried and then re-divorced. And, um, there was this condominium that, um, was being foreclosed on. So it was, uh, the con, her condo where I was living, uh, was being foreclosed on. She was receiving the notices. So I, um, just went, started going to, to work full time. And while I was working, while I was a full time student also. And that was really hard. So that made my, my grades suffer a lot because I couldn't devote the amount of time that I needed to get the A's. So, um, what were you studying? I was studying, I decided to become an economics major early on and, um, uh, you know, guns and butter. And, uh, it seemed easy enough, but I ended up getting a C in that course. (laughs) I was like, what the heck is going on here? You know, I, I, it shocked me, but I was, it was very difficult. Yeah. It was very difficult. You know, coming up, you know, having an A average from high school and then going down and getting C's in college in your first year was humbling. And where were you working? I was working as a food service, uh, in, in, in food service, really. I was delivering the patient trays. So I was at UCLA, um, and, uh, they have these portable carts that look like these columns and there's, you know, maybe 30 trays in there and they're warmed up. And I would just roll that cart, you know, to the Jules Stein Eye Institute and, the various floors and just deliver the trays and then go pick the trays up and did that for a couple of years. Yeah. But it paid the bills again. And I made about $14,000 that, that over a year of doing that. And I gave it all to my mom and I Mm -hmm. saved 1400. I saved 10%. 
and I, I gave her the rest and she, uh, we were able to keep the condo. So that was good. That's yeah. awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. It's a good story. So when, so when you graduated from UCLA, did you graduate with an economics degree? No. So, um, I was a little, I mean, I was pretty discouraged with the poor showing there. With the C? With that, with that C. And, uh, and my, uh, and <clears throat> also early on, something that I didn't, I didn't mention is growing up, my mom, she worked as a bank teller. So when I was, um, you know, early on, you know, going to, to private school, et cetera, uh, she, um, she would tell me that there was this one particular client who would come in, um, and he was an anesthesiologist and he would show up with in his tennis outfit all the time and drop off these massive checks. <laughs> so she had, uh, she had a little bit of a, she was inspired, let's say. So she said, I'm going to raise my son to become a doctor who plays tennis. <laughs> and that's exactly what I ended up doing, which oh, is so funny. Man. It's so funny, you know, but you can mold a child, right? You know, and so if you put the right effort and you get lucky, you know, as well. How did she plant those seeds? Well, she just said, I want you to become a doctor and a lawyer since, or a lawyer since, uh, uh, since an early age. So it was part of my DNA, I guess, at that point, you know, she just inserted it (laughs) in there. And, um, so when I was in college, you know, I, I was an econ major early on, but I always felt I was going to do something, uh, in medicine. So I just formally changed it. I didn't know what to go into. You know, there isn't like a medical school major, you know, so, and that's the, that's the other thing. Since nobody else had gone to college, I was sort of, I was, it's very easy to be mis- misled, you know, um, and to get bad advice and from others that may be well intended, intended, but, um, they, um, you know, the, there were there were so many things that I would have done differently that my children now hopefully will not have to repeat any of those mistakes. But you know, I didn't know what the SAT was. I just went in and I took one day. I just I just took the test. You know, I wish I would have studied more for that. Uh, that's probably why I didn't get into Stanford. You know, uh, <laughs> um, as a college student because <clears throat> I applied and they said no. Um, and uh, there, you know, I was trying to figure out what's the proper way of. Um, Uh, or what's the best major to have if I want to go to medical school. Uh, So a friend of mine told me that he was uh, choosing physiology at the time it was called kinesiology. And uh, so I I chose, I chose that major and it seemed like a great major. It seemed, it made a lot of sense because I was learning a lot of anatomy with it. Um, Did that come easy for you? Those classes? no, No, nothing came. I mean, I, I, did very well. I got A's practically in almost all of those court courses, but it didn't come without a tremendous amount of, of study. So I just, I was very prepared. You know, I would get up in the mornings. Um, I mean, at one point I was getting up at four 30 in the morning, um, you know, writing out my day, um, on a piece of paper, scheduling study, study time between classes and then right after class. And then I was also heavily involved in extracurricular. Like I was thinking <clears throat> very early about how my application to medical school was going to look. And I was looking at it in terms of strength and they needed to be well-rounded. So, um, when where does this discipline start coming from? At this, so you're you know, in college, but you're very disciplined. You're writing out your day, yeah. the time that you're starting. You're look, you're <clears throat> thinking about medical school and what the application is going to be like, yes. and you're preparing. Where does that insight come from? I think it just. I think it comes from, um, like no one was mentoring school, you. No, there was no mentor. There was no one like saying, "Hey, this is what you have to do." It just seemed. Well, I think at some point, if you put an expectation on yourself to get, let's say, A's and you're in a very competitive environment like UCLA and in the, in the sciences is extremely competitive. I mean, there are 300 kids in the class. It's um, everything's based on a curve. I mean, if everybody gets a 90 on a test, you're not getting an A, you're getting a C. So you have to get a 90. And that literally happened. Wow. On a chemistry exam where I got a 94 and I got a B. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, in, it's intense. It's intense. I mean, that that, is intense. then to fast forward a little bit when, um, after entering Harvard medical school, I was on the admissions committee for a year and it was known at the table there when we're discussing the applicants that if you come from a UC school, that your GPA is, um, probably higher than it actually reflects on paper because of how cutthroat the UC system in the sciences is. That is interesting. Mm-hmm. 
So you're becoming very disciplined and then you apply to medical school. How yes. many medical schools did you apply to or, or were you like, I'm going to Harvard and this is where I'm going? No, I mean, to me, Harvard was going to be one of those like dream schools to uh, go into. And um, I applied I applied to about 20 different schools, but I applied to Hopkins and Yale and Stanford and you know Harvard and um, UC San Diego, UCLA. I applied about 20 different schools and, you know, I got into every single one of them. Except oh, for wow. except for UC San Diego, UC San Diego said, "Well, uh, that's a mistake on UC San Diego." <laughs> well, maybe they figured I probably wouldn't go there, or maybe I just didn't meet their criteria. I mean, who knows? You know, the different schools are looking for different things. So, um, yeah, so that was that was great. So, but you know, when I remember interviewing at Harvard Medical School, I was I was so impressed with the campus and uh, obviously with the tradition and with the opportunity. So, to me, it was a no brainer. I, I went. So you were headed to Boston. Was did your mom go with you? She didn't. It's a good question. She now she was remarried at this time, so she's been married a few times. So uh, she got remarried at that time, and so she stayed in Los Angeles with her husband. <clears throat> and yeah, Boston was a change. Um, I wasn't. Uh, my immune system was a little stronger, and so I was able to handle the winters there a little better without developing respiratory issues. So I was I was fine, uh, and. But it was just another, um, you have to be very disciplined, you know. And so uh, I, all I know about Boston, all I seem to really remember, I mean, not all, but the majority of my memory is just studying in isolation, really, at Catway Library. Um, there were no fraternities or I think there was something in medical school. No, they do have that. So I have a very different, so a friend of mine went to medical school at the same time, and he said he partied so hard in medical school and he partied a lot more than he did in college. Was and he at UC San Diego? No, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't. He was. Uh, he was the East Coast, and um, and uh, but you know, he struggled to be to get his credentials. I mean, he he failed his board exams a few times, and it was on the brink of not ever uh, being able to become a doctor. But he did become a doctor, and you know, that's the thing. That's the thing about the MD. You know, or um, you never know. You know, if your doctor was like first in the class or at the bottom of the class, right. all that matters is that they got the MD. Right. So it right. didn't matter. So, you know, he, he has great memories, but you know, his background's a little, a little different too. Yeah. So. so you're yeah. at Harvard Medical School. How, how many years was that? That was, so it, it turned out to be a total of five. It was, it's four years, but, um, I, I received a Fulbright scholarship in the middle of it and I traveled to Italy and I worked in a, in a laboratory there for about nine, nine months. Yeah. And when you were dreaming of just getting out and taking care of people at that time, or did you start having this entrepreneur bug in you? There was always that entrepreneur bug in me at, at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, in, in high school, I started off, uh, cleaning houses. So I would clean houses with my, with my buddy, um, with my best friend at the time, but he, he dropped out of that scheme after we saw our first house and the pigsty that people would <laughs> leave their homes and expect us to like organize and clean up for them. So, but I kept that going on for the summer. So, um, I had probably about five or six regulars, if you will. And, um, you know, I would go door to door and sell various coupons for gas companies, um, you know, for car companies and maintenance coupons to fix your car. Um, there were, I was always trying to bring in some extra money somehow through, through business. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, the entrepreneur bug was, was there, but during, during college and during medical school, um, it lied dormant just because the material was, um, keeping me pretty mm -hmm. busy, Yeah, pretty busy, you know, and I, I wish I had more, I don't know, mental capacity to have handled that and a bunch of other things, but I also had to worry about money and so, and, and working. And so there wasn't another, you know, source of income. So, um, but to Harvard's credit though, so they, they have a program where, um, they say they do not give scholarships out, uh, because everybody is meritorious because they've already achieved such, you know, they've been very successful academically. So they give, um, scholarships, if you will, based on need. So I got the full scholarship every single year, which oh. was really great. And then fast forwarding, um, after I sold my company, um, I went back and I, I started a foundation at Harvard Medical School for kids similar to my situation. So oh. they have scholarships now. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I've, I've been giving back. 
So you're graduating um, Harvard Law School, or sorry, Harvard Medical School, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then you go and become a doctor where? Um, I started at, well, so I decided to go into emergency med- medicine. And, and, and actually, this is sort of an important point. I was going to become a urologist. So I had completed two sub-internships, one at Cornell, one at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And I had done a lot of reading. I was really happy with the, with the field. And one of the attendings, um, you know, one of the mentors in your ur- urology spoke to me and he said, so what do you want to do? And I said, yeah, I want to become you know, a urologist. And I want to do some, some business too. And I want to get some, and he looked at me, he said, business, he says, you're not, you're not going to have time to do any business on the side. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're in surgery. You have your surgery days and you have your clinic days. He says, there's no time to start anything else. And that sort of blew my mind and made me have like a come to Jesus moment. Like, whoa, I'm about to declare what my specialty is going to be. And I just made a pivotal decision at that point. Right after that conversation, I said, I can't become a urologist and be an entrepreneur. I didn't think I had that capacity. So I needed to choose a specialty in medicine that would allow me to walk away, not be tied to a beeper not be tied to a pager, not have you know, clinic days. I needed shift, shift work where I could set my own schedule. And that's what emergency medicine is. It's perfect field. So you can work, you know, you can choose to work four shifts a month or 30 shifts a month. You know, you can really work as much or as little as you want. And when your shift is over, your shift is over. No one is calling you back. That's amazing. To come in and it's a perfect specialty for an entrepreneur in medicine. And I think that's why there are so many entrepreneurs in medicine who were um, or, and who are uh, emergency medicine specialists. So you um, start working as this physician in the emergency room. When do you start laying the framework for your first business? So <clears throat> I ended up uh, choosing emergency medicine. I did my internship in New York City um, and then I went to UCLA, all of you medical school program or all of you medical center program for the following three years. And um, my, I decided to take a job. Uh, well, I was looking for what the highest paying job for an emergency medicine doctor was. I mean, that's just exactly what I was looking for. And the highest paying job when I was graduating, um, a resident colleague of mine told me, he said, oh, well, there's a place in Antelope Valley in Lancaster, which is about 80 miles north of Los Angeles. And they were paying at the time like $150 an hour, which was a, a lot of money coming out. And it still is a lot of money. And um, I, I remember I drove out there and I was expecting an or, a formal interview process. But as I drove up there, there were 20 ambulances outside the ambulance bay. Um, it was pandemonium inside. I mean, but it was organized chaos, organized chaos. And um, I, I walked in without an appointment. I spoke to, I said, oh, you know, who is the... Um, the director of the emergency department, and they introduced me to an individual, Dr. Lin. And, you know, he spoke to me, he said, oh, where are you coming from? I was like, oh, UCLA. And he goes, oh, okay, great. Do, do you want a job? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so it was just so <laughs> the most easiest casual conversation. And then I wasn't supposed to start until I graduated in June, uh, which was going to be a month later. But uh, one of the other doctors who was there and apparently was just getting fried uh, because of the volume and the difficulty of the cases. Um, uh, he says, hey, I know you're not starting for another month. You're not technically done with your residency for another month, but it was Memorial Week. And he goes, do you uh, just want to take all my shifts? <laughs> and I had like this challenge on the table. I said, uh, okay, I'll do it. Sure. So um, I went m- Memorial Weekend and it was, it was, I guess, um, trial by fire, you know, really now you're by yourself, you're out there and you've got these crazy cases. And, you know, I, I didn't kill anybody, which was great. Um, that is good. That's really good. But I learned very, very quickly, um, whether I was going to be able to take all of my practice and all my training and use it successfully as an independent thinker in the emergency room by myself without, you know, and attending to lean back on and, in that environment, you learn very quickly and, mm. uh, it worked out. It worked out very well. Yeah. So was it there that you started thinking about well, this? Well, what was so funny is that I was, um, I was 
So I guess when I first started working there, I went to my first case and there was somebody who just showed up right behind me and I looked at him and I'm like, who are you? And he goes, Oh, I'm your scribe. I'm like, what's a scribe? And he says, well, a scribe is somebody that writes for you. And I'm just going to write down the history and exam. And I was like, okay. And at the time we had these T sheets, which were these check boxes. So there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, sentence writing or word writing. There was a lot of check boxes, right? So, um, at the end of that shift, having that scribe, I was, and, and that was a very difficult place to work in. Um, I saw more patients at the end of that one shift than I had seen my entire, um, emergency medicine career up to that point. I saw many more patients and it occurred to me that the only reason I was so much more efficient, if you will, was because of having somebody else document for me. And at that moment, um, I decided, oh, I, I need to create a scribe pro program and sell this to other people because I had never heard of this concept. And so this particular emergency group. When you say program, you mean turn it into technology? Oh, no, no meaning, I'm sorry, yeah, turning it into a service program, um, something that I could service and market. Because there other hospitals, other hospitals that you had been at, you hadn't seen the scribe service, not even not seen it. No one ever, no one ever spoke about it. And, and it just, it really just happened that. So this one, this is, was one ER group. It, it was a private group. So it's a, it's a group of ER doctors who had, um, won that contract to provide emergency medical services for this particular hospital. If I, I mean, I don't want to misstate it, but I think back in the seventies or eighties and, um, they, were there at the beginning of emergency medicine when it became a, spe a specialty uh, during the heyday. And um, they were extremely successful. Um, and they, at, at some point, decided to, um, one, of, one of the organizers of this particular group has um, his son, he asked his son if he would document for him one day. And the son came by and it, it seemed to work out. And then, um, so this particular doctor, asked his son, hey, do you know anybody else who would like to document for us? And so the son went out and sort of recruited a few people. And that's how that began. So it was a, it was a very, uh, it's, you know, I mean, they get the credit, you know, in my book for having started a program. Um, that I, you took off and... Well, I think where they, where they failed to capitalize on it, though. That's the thing. Right. Um, you know, they... They weren't thinking they weren't scaling thinking, it. And... No, they weren't thinking of, of scaling it or of organizing it with like a formal training. You know, I mean, cause, you know, I ended up writing the first textbook for this company, for this new service, or trying to get the job category recognized um, by um, uh, the recognition boards, you know, for, for this in the medical industry. And... Um, you know, that's where, that's where I came through. And I just looked at things very differently from that, from that point. And then when I did some research, I realized that the first use of a scribe was, I think, from 1971, um, out of Illinois. I believe that correct. Illinois or Indiana. I forget now. It's been a while since I read the article, but you can look it up in Pub, PubMed. And, um, and he started a scribe, uh, uh, service that he published with his nurses. And then when it would become very busy in the emergency room, the nurses would go back to nursing. But when it wasn't busy, they would go back to scribing. And um, there was a couple of case reports. And then there was my experience with this company. And then I decided to uh, create a company and, you know, and to establish, you know, a formal training session, uh, some formality, some structure, some rigor to it and market it and sell it, uh, which we did. We ended up going to... Um, Wait, before you get there, yes. so you're in the ER, you have this idea, I'm going to start Scribe America. Yes. And you start this company. How, mm. Is it just you at this point? No. So that person that was behind me, uh, my, my scribe, if you will. Um, you started the company with him? With, with him. So he, yeah, he wasn't, he had recently, um, his name is Michael, and he had recently um Was he an independent from, contractor to these guys so he could do stuff with you? No, he was an employee. He was a, but you know, he was a young kid. So I was, you know, I think at the time, what was I? Maybe 30. What, what, what would that be? Maybe 34, uh, I think. And he was, um, 24 around there. And, um, he, uh, I think it was 33. He was 20, 23. And he had just recently returned from, uh, being in the army. 
So uh, he was, he achieved ranger status, if you will. So he's very good at what he was doing and he was a disciplined person. And um, he was looking for something else to do. So a, a career and uh, he was approached by the son of that doctor who started the scribe program in the emergency room that I spoke about earlier. Um, and uh, he ended up picking up a job working as a scribe and then bumped into me. And then with all of my ambition and my desire to, you know, try and make a business out of everything, it seemed that at that point, um, uh, I would talk to him about this and say, Hey, you know, we should start a business. We should call it Scribe America. I remember taking him to Johnny Rockets one day and, um, uh, writing on a, on a napkin. I wish I had a napkin, but I wrote it out. And I thought at the time that we're going to call it Scribe America. We're going to, after we sell it to 10 hospitals, we'll go public. You know, just really naive. Um, I mean, you can't really go public after selling it just to 10 hospitals. You don't really have the revenue to be, uh, you know, on the Dow Jones or anything of that sort. So the market, uh, and so, um, but you know, we, we started this company together. It, so it was, it was his company and my company and we, um, decided to, uh, you know, at the very beginning, you know, I was the medical doctor and so, and he was going to apply for college again, back to college. So he ended up finishing at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and then uh, at some point right after that, he wanted to go to medical school. So we started the company uh, before he went to medical school, uh, before he decided that he wanted to go to medical school. We started the company and um, right away decided that he should be the CEO and I should just handle everything else. It wouldn't make much sense, you know, at that time, for instance, for, for me to be the CEO, if you would, because then what's his role? You know, so I had a lot of the business background at that time and um, we had to figure things out. How do you figure out payroll, an employee handbook? Um, what are the labor issues, contracts, um, you know, seed money, seed capital to get things done. Um, so did you start with seed capital or did you just fund everything in the beginning? So th that was beautiful about this particular company is that, um, you know, you would, we would build the contracts mm -hmm. and um, there would be funding from the contracts that would cover everything. So there wasn't a lot of, in terms of capital expenditures or a tremendous amount of um, money needed to float the payroll. Maybe you would have to carry the payroll for a couple of weeks until you got paid from the client. Um, and there were only a couple of times that, um, I needed to come in and, and, and help out, you know, there was, uh, you know, financially. So there was a couple of times where we were short on payroll at the very beginning, maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars So, so I it sounds like you ramped up that. pretty quickly. Well, we started off slowly. I mean, um, you know, he, you know, he received a little bit of capital also from his grandfather that, that helped out. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was a few thousand dollars. And then our first employee, um, uh, Sarah, she uh, became the chief operating officer of the company too. And, um, you know, she was very organized and, and uh, was really good at training um, our employees. And so she was a natural fit. And she was, a, you know, a real critical part of the piece. And she would, she worked without uh, knowing that she was going to get paid on the back end a lot of, a lot of times. So when the, when there wasn't enough money to pay her, um, what she earned, you know, what she deserved at the time, you know, she would, she would get it later on. So she, she ended up working a lot of time I mean, for as much as she worked for the company, you know, she gave a lot of that, um, uh, time and, and effort for free mm -hmm. really, because she worked more than she was compensated at the beginning. The so you guys build up this company and you eventually sell it for $140 million. I think 134.5. Okay. 134.5. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. How, how long did it take you to build it up and sell it? 10 years. So we, I mean, there were individuals company that wanted to purchase the company after about five or six years. And, um, I heard them out. I wanted to, to hear what they had to say just for my own research, because I knew at some point we were going to sell the company and I, I, did, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't want to be taken advantage of. So I, I'd listen to them. And it was really funny because after you listen to more than one, you realize there are these catchphrases that um, the company, that the industry uses. 
And it seems so organic originally when I heard it for the first time, but I realized it's not. It's part of a, it's part of a strategy, I guess, of talking to potential clients. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no other way, I guess, of calling it. That's just the way that I, that I saw it. Maybe I'm paranoid in some way, but to me, it seemed, you know, uh, you have to watch out. So, you know, it's just stuff like, Hey, you know, why don't you take another bite of the apple and want to take some chips off the table and here's a 30,000 foot view. And I didn't speak like that. This is business parlance, I guess. Right. So for me, it was a new, um, introduction into a new culture, a new way of talking and, uh, what people were really saying between the lines. And, um, so, uh, I remember reading about, uh, I remember, um, you know, I ended up getting a book that taught me on how to sell a company also around this particular time. Do you remember the name of the book? It was something about, uh, I don't have the exact title. I mean, I'm sure I can find, but it was, it was, um, how to sell your, your business. And in it, it spoke about, and it wasn't a particularly popular book. I just needed to get some information that was independent. And it, it spoke about, um, investment bankers, what an appropriate or what, I guess, yeah, what an appropriate amount of a, a cost that should entail with an investment banker, um, how much, you know, they should charge you for the services, um, what the buyers are really trying to buy and how they're going about it and what's going to happen to the seller once the buyer transacts. Um, so you didn't have an attorney helping you through all this. You turned to a textbook or a book. Well, at the, at the very beginning, just before we decided to, to hire, um, I mean, because during the actual process, once you sign a letter of intent, um, you know, we did have to choose who was going to be our, our mergers and acquisition attorney on our end. And so I did choose somebody at that point, but, but there was a lot of runway, if you will, before that. And so I ended up reading a textbook on it and, uh, which, which helped. They helped a lot with the negotiation with the investment bankers. I think we would have ended up, um, spending a lot more money. It also helped a lot in terms of re rejecting the first deal that came across the table because I saw things in there like clawbacks and escrow amounts that I had read about in the book to be very wary of. Right. And so, you know, um, we, we got a very big number early on one of the offers, but the details, the devil was in the details and, um, you know, the consensus of the group at the time was, yeah, you know, let's, let's go forward with it. And I was like, no, let's, let's not because of these reasons. And we didn't. And then I think they are, you know, our investment bankers at that time, I think they knew exactly that, you know, at least me in particular, I wasn't going to sell unless I, unless these criteria were met a certain way. And, um, the next offer that we had was exactly the right type of offer. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked out great. So what was the biggest challenge of growing Scribe America? I mean, the biggest challenge, um, you know, gosh, I'd say it was so busy. Um, and you have to be willing to, you have to be flexible because as the company is growing, it's taking more and more of your attention. And, um, it was a type of attention where I saw that the more effort I put into it, the more it would get back. So it made sense to put my eggs in that basket. But some other things that we hadn't spoken about was at the time that I started Scrap America, I was also trying to open up a bank here in Nevada. Uh, I had a group, I had a, a real estate group that I was a part of, I had a cosmetic practice that I had started. I was one of the, you know, um, I was really, really early, uh, maybe one of the first doctors to start using bot Botox and, and dermal fillers. So I had that, that practice. I had a laser machine. Um, and these are, you know, these other endeavors were not paying me. And I was also a full-time ER doctor. So these other endeavors were not, I did, I didn't see the reward, um, as great as I did for Scrap America. And so as Scrap America grew, I would come to these roadblock or to these forks in the road where I don't have enough time to pursue cosmetics. You know, I don't have enough time to, um, uh, you know, maybe to continue working with, uh, trying to put the bank together. Um, and, and I don't have, and I didn't have enough time to continue working as a full, uh, full-time emergency medicine doctor. And so those were very difficult to let go of. Um, it sounds like so many entrepreneurs spend so much time in the business. It sounds like you've been really disciplined about staying 
outside and, you know, not getting too deep in the business and working on it every day. Cause you were still working as an ER physician, running various companies. So it doesn't sound like you were figuring out everything. You put the right people in place and built that company up. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I wasn't working in it. Like for instance, I never scribed for anybody, if you will, you know, that would have been like, you know, working in the business, let's say. Right. Um, and I wasn't working, uh, so you accounting. stayed the visionary. Yeah. And that was really, yeah, that was, that was really, and then also just, yeah, the visionary in the sense of these are the elements that we need, you know, um, to stay, you know, legal, um, to do things the right way, um, to not risk ourselves with liability. You know, the medical field is highly litigious. And so how do you navigate a new company? And especially this particular industry was unknown. There was no scribe industry. And so, um, you know, things that would keep me up at night would be, well, what if some regulation is passed one day that you can't use scribes in the, in, in a medical department? You know, I mean, that could just by the stroke of a pen say that that's outlawed. Um, these particular individuals, how well were they vetted? You know, there were no scribe schools to attend. It wasn't like becoming a medical assistant and something that was tried and true. Right. So, um, I was looking forward, you know, I mean, I, at the time I also started a, a nonprofit, um, the uh, American uh, Association of Scribes, something of that sort. But um, the whole purpose of that company, that nonprofit was to protect the industry. And uh, I wanted to set up uh, industry standard practices um, that we as leaders in the industry felt were um, good practices because as you could tell, you know, just like with anything, when one company, it's a new industry and it starts to, to blossom, you get a lot of copycats. So we were the only company at the American College in the Emergency Physician Conference. One year when, when I started the company, there were no other scribe companies. The following year, there were two. And when I sold the company, there were 24 at the same conference. Wow. And so, you know, as everybody is fighting for this, you know, get a slice of the pie, um, um, some, some companies were not practicing, uh, in an ethical manner, as you would expect in any in- industry. Right. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, if a scribe was involved in a bad patient outcome, that the word scribe doesn't become, um, a negative in the public view. I mean, it was, we were just, you know, one bad outcome, uh, away from, um, you know, you know, maligning the term scribe and that I would be very concerned about that. So I wanted to make sure that, well, we have certified scribes, you know, they were a scribe, they weren't a certified scribe since I was creating the certification program for becoming a scribe and aligning ourselves with, um, health education, um, boards, uh, to recognize the job category as a scribe, you know, um, and I even created like an exam, a national competency exam for scribes. So I wrote this exam as well. And, you would become certified by passing the exam and um, showing a minimum amount of work that you had performed in, in the emergency room or in whatever discipline you were in medicine. You know, I, that was a way of us sort of separating ourselves, our certified scribes from other scribes that weren't certified. Mm-hmm. So you sell the company and uh, wh- what comes next for you? So I, I know we had talked earlier, you mm-hmm. said that as you were becoming an entrepreneur and building your business that you waited till you were 40 to get married. Yes. So now that you've, uh, are you married? You're not married yet, right? No. When you sell the company? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. So, no, no. So these are a couple, well, for me, I wanted to wait until I was 40 before I had a family. Oh, like, okay. I like, I would have gotten married. So I actually did get married when I was 33, right when I was finishing my residency, you know, I uh, came across this gorgeous girl and I knew I was going to start making a lot of money, you know, from $40,000 a year as a resident to $30,000 a month as an attending. And so I wanted, um, I felt, Hey, I can have a family now at some point, you know? Um, and, but I quickly learned that, that, you know, it didn't work out. I filed for a divorce after 11 months because we had nothing in common. <laughs> we had nothing in common and she was contributing she zero was to the beautiful. table. She was just gorgeous. And, and I was, I, I looked at myself in the day and I said, what am I doing? Come on. This is not what I want. She brought so, nothing to the table. She brought nothing to the table. I mean, she's a sweet girl, sweet girl, sweet person, but not for a guy like me, like what I need from right. a, a partnership and, and everything. So, um, 
after that, I said, well, I'm not going to get, you know, married. I'm definitely not having any children until I'm 40. Cause I really wanted to focus on my, my business and the different, I wanted to focus on becoming financially independent. And I, I didn't think there was any way that I could do that and raise a family at the same time. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I figured, Hey, I'll, I'll father children when I'm 40, 40, 41. And you know, that's exactly how it turned out. So, uh, I, I remarried at 38. Um, and I, and no, I actually remarried at 40. I guess I met her at 38 or you married at 40. And then at 40, at 41, we had our first child. We had another child that when I was 43 and then I had my last child when I was 40, 45. Yeah. And, uh, and that worked out great. So I sold the company in 2014, um, which, um, you know, and it's interesting too, because I, you know, I knew that the company was coveted, if you will, that there were a lot of individuals that wanted to purchase. They loved the cash flow. The company had tremendous cash flow, didn't have any in- inventory and there was zero debt. So I had wow. no debt on this company whatsoever. And I was really, really proud of having run such a, you know, me and my partners and we, we, we ran a highly efficient company. Um, and you know, well, the other thing, you know, we had a certified audit. Whenever you sell the company, they have to certify the buyers have to certify the audit through a large uh, accounting company, a nationally recognized one. And they went back two years and they didn't find any impropriety at all whatsoever. Not a single, you know, penny was out of place. Um, and believe me, there was millions of dollars in our accounts um, for the company. And somebody could have done something unscrupulous at that time. But all of the any, any debits, if you would, had to come through me. And so, um, uh, what we didn't discuss is meaning every check. Did you sign every check? No, meaning like, um, they didn't sign every check, but meaning, um, if there were any expenses that were not company expenses, they had to, uh, it was something that, you know, I had to agree to. And then also my business partners had to agree to. So you had really good tight controls. We had really tight control. Um, and just our character also was one that we wanted to, you know, we were, I mean, we were paying ourselves well enough, but we didn't, um, you know, I, I read and I hear about a lot of companies when there's a lot of temptation to go into the company coffers, if you will, and use that income or use that revenue for personal gain. And we didn't do that. You know, I, so you never took distributions. Never, I mean, well, I never, we paid ourselves, you know, okay. um, monthly, but all of the, all of the expenses were all company related expenses. Uh, there was nothing improper. And the reason I'm, I'm sort of harping on that is because, you know, I mentioned earlier about start, trying to start a bank. Um, well, that turned out, I, I started, I started to, um, I got involved in this company. Um, there was a, a plastic surgeon when I was a resident who um, was born in Hong Kong and had a vision for um, starting a real estate empire. And this, this is sort of like during the, the heyday of like 2004, 2000, 2005, when real estate prices were dub, doubling every two years. And so we went along with it. And then he had this great idea of starting a Chinese bank, a small Chinese bank. And he showed how um, it would be very successful in Nevada. And he aligned himself with another company called Carpenter and Company, who is a very reputable um, bank, uh, if you will, the, this individual at Carpenter, he had started about 440 different banks at the time. Very successful, knew exactly what he was doing. And our, the leader of our particular group um, was able to get a lot of credibility just by aligning himself. So the reason why that credibility is important and I'm harping on it is because moving down, you know, three, four years later and several trips to Hong Kong later that I did with him and went to Shanghai with him. Um, it turned out that he, you know, he, he had raised a lot of money and he was using the money for personal gain. So he ended up buying, you know, uh, a vehicle for himself, um, uh, spending a lot of money on himself. And so when we were going through the state charter uh, and, and trying to get our federal charter, uh, we didn't pass the audit. And we all discovered that he was running a Ponzi scheme. And so the reason, and, and it was really upsetting because um, I remember having, you know, asked 
early on, hey, you know, can I see the bank records? He goes, no, no, no. He goes, that's just for me. And I didn't have the, I wasn't assertive enough to say, well, no, I demand to see the bank records. I'm an investor. And um, if you don't show me the bank records and I'm pulling my money out, I should have been assertive like that. And I wasn't. I went along with it because I knew, I knew him. And so that's the problem about going into business with, let's say, people that you know or friends or acquaintances is that you let your guard down, you let your objectivity down. Um, and he, you know, he used the money for personal gain. He was running a Ponzi scheme. And so when it came time to set up the financial, you know, accounts and checks and balances for Scrab America, I said, I'm never letting that happen to me again. So I'm going to be in charge because I know every single penny is going to be accounted for and any personal expenses are not going to be covered by the company. Um, and so it really helped because it could have gotten very messy. We probably wouldn't have sold the company, you know, if there were, um, debits that were un unaccounted for, you know, if we ended up buying ourselves exotic sports cars, you know, and, uh, fancy trips, uh, which a lot of people do. Yeah. That's great advice that if you're going to build the cell that you should make sure that the records are clean and that you do things right. So when the seller buyer comes in, that it's in, it, it moves through. It moves through yeah, because they will certify, um, they're going to get a certified audit. Right. There'll be accounting right. to look for. So you're going to have to explain everything that you've done. So don't commingle funds, keep everything separate from the very beginning. Right. Not even one transaction, because you're going to have to explain that one transaction That's that good. happened three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So you sell the company and then um, you decide how many years later to buy a plumbing company. So, yeah. So I, you know, <laughs> so I sold the company, you know, I, I made this, you know, um, really transformational amount of money, you know? Um, and, uh, I said, well, what am I going to do? You know, it was so funny. I remember I, I had to deposit the money somewhere. So I accepted a wire into my checking account at bank of America. And I get this, you know, I, so I go into bank of America. Um, I walk into bank of America and like these two guys in black were there like dressed in black with like glasses on waiting for you pretty much waiting so for you me. call but so you have an account I didn't know they were America, be there. you're yeah. like i'm about ready to get millions and millions of dollars yeah and there's two guys waiting for you there were two guys waiting for me and they say oh we are from the private wealth company here oh. a branch of <laughs> oh, bank of america you. and they say no Except they said over here sir. and they said yeah you uh you're you're uh your money uh, should not belong here it should belong in our private wealth fund or you know instead of not a fund but they're the branch if you will you know, and I was very paranoid. I said, what are you guys trying to steal my money? What's going on here? But no, it turns out, you know, they, um, they represent, um, it's us trust and, uh, now it's bank of America and they got rid of the name, but anyway, they, um, that's where the private wealth clients invest their money with. And so they, um, it was just sort of funny to, to walk in there. And, and so I, I had to do something with this income, right? So, um, did you like pick buckets? You know, well, I had this. So my original thought was, I mean, my original thought was I'm just going to buy a bunch of CD ladders and just buy like a bucket load of CD ladders, you know, and, uh, have, cause I didn't want to lose it. Cause I, I didn't need get rich money anymore. Right. I just needed to stay rich. I just wanted a strategy where I wouldn't lose it. And it would just, you know, grow a few percent a year. That's all I need. Right. And, um, uh, you know, I, I ended up investing with them, but I, I, I didn't want them to invest the entire amount. So I took half of it and I invested it myself in real estate. So I bought property in New York and in, in LA and, uh, Toronto, you know, where my current wife's family is from. And, nice. um, yeah, you know, investment properties. And then, and then I had some money and then I decided to, uh, I needed something else to do. I tried the first six months, you know, like, oh, you made it. You know, I think I was, I was 44 and I was like, look at this. I made it. Great. I made all this money and I'm, I'm young and I can do whatever I want. And I realized, uh, I'm not cut out to just sit around and drink margaritas and travel the world. That's not what I want to do. It seemed like a tremendous waste of, it actually felt like a tremendous waste of potential. You know, like, look, I learned something. I have this particular skill. I need to recognize it. And I need to do something with it. Now, I don't know if going into plumbing was the right way of doing it, but I needed to stay busy. And that's what I wanted to do was to stay busy. I didn't want to do anything in the medical field, something else. Um, I wanted a completely different challenge. And what occurred to me was as, you know, as the company was growing, you know, I, I had, I lived in a triplex and then eventually I moved into a house, but 
any of the electrical or plumbing issues that I would have, I was completely off thumbs. And it was such a contrast because I felt so confident in the emergency room where, you know, I was, became a board certified, you know, doctor. And, and you could fix things. I could fix things, you know, and, and I, patients, I remember patients coming to me with no signs of life and then resuscitating them. And then they walk out of the hospital. I mean, that literally happened. You but know? you can't fix your plumbing. And so now here's this new no, challenge. No, and then like, yeah, like I have a drain issue and I call rotor rooter to come over. And these guys are telling me well, we have to like dig a trench and do all this stuff. And I'm looking at them very suspiciously like, come on, man. You know, am I really that dumb? This, is, this plumbing issue is going to cost me $10,000. Uh, but I, I didn't have any knowledge. And so I hated that feeling of helplessness. So after I sold the company, um, a year later, um, I got tired of the margaritas on the beach and I, uh, I became a journey. I went to vocational training school at this point now. And so, uh, I became like a, at a community college. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like that. And I became did a, they know, uh, like, did your classmates no, know, like I'm sitting next to a Harvard no, trained medical doctor? <laughs> no, no, no. I kept all of that under, <laughs> under wraps. No, 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 no. Because, you know, it's a completely different industry, you know, a completely different culture. And How long was the schooling? It was a year. Did it you was get one a scholarship? Year. I graduated valedictorian in my class. Let's <laughs> just say that. Shocking. <laughs> Something that I couldn't do. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, became an electrician. I have a journeyman's card in Nevada. And then I went back to vocational school and, uh, became certified in HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So that was another year. And then I decided, well, let me just buy a plumbing company because I don't have the plumbing part down. So let me get the plumbing part down. So that's what I've been doing now since, since June and, um, of last year. And it's been, it's kept me extremely busy because now I'm actually involved. Now I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the company too, because I don't know anything about plumbing and the parts. And it's actually a lot of vocabulary, a lot of stuff to get your head around. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm in the field. I'm, I'm not, I mean, just the other day I'm out there residences, you know, a, a customer's home, um, snaking out their sewer. I mean, you know, oh I'm, I'm, I'm literally snaking out their, their sewer. I wow. mean, that's what I'm doing. Are you so, having fun? I am having fun and I feel like I'm learning a lot. And, um, are you going to build this company to sell it too? Eventually. Yeah. That's the, that's the plan. I mean, right now I just, it seems like there's so much more to learn. And, um, it sounds like that's what your mission is. is just it to is. Learn and I mean, there's no inventory controls in this company. There's a lot of inventory. This is different than what my company was before. Um, you know, there's a lot of employee turnover, um, and, and, there's so many practices that need to be put into, into place that uh, I'm a little, at times I feel a little overwhelmed because I'm trying to bring all of this to the company by myself. And it's, it's hard when you're working in the company and you're doing calls and you're trying to work on the company, you sort of can't do both very well. Right. So I'm at a little bit of a crossroads now, but I'll figure it out. Wow. <laughs> So how do you balance right now work and family? Do you, are you working a lot? You mm -hmm. know, you said you're running calls, you're running the business, mm -hmm. you're dealing with inventory issues. Do you? Huh? Yeah, I, I'm, um, well, so I bought into a company where my partner knew, um, it, it wasn't an anonymous purchase, but you know, he knew we were friends before this, we became friends. And um, he knew that I was going to, you know, limit, I was going to put some limits on the amount of time that I spent on the company. Um, but I'm in the company, you know, I, I basically work from 7 a.m. to about 5 p.m. with the company, um, Monday to Friday. And then when I'm done on Friday, I take Friday, Saturday, Sunday completely off, but we're still running calls. Mm -hmm. It's a 24 hour company. We have night service and everything. Right. Um, and, uh, but I take the kids to school in the morning. I do homework with them at night. Um, I cook dinner for them. So I'm able to have meaningful interaction with them and feel good about being a parent, being a father, you know, yeah, uh, doing the right things with them, with them. And, um, uh, and like on the weekends, so like now, you know, I'm, it, we painted my daughter, one of my daughter's rooms right now. So now I have to put all the electrical back in there because we took all these lights down. So I got to put it all back and took some of the switches down. So I got to put it back. Up. So what so. does the future hold after the plumbing company? Will you just, you, with this mission to continue to well, learn, like, what do you, what else are you interested in? Like, well, repair? so, so I bought, I bought land to build a house okay. out, out here. And so I'd like to see if with the electrical and the plumbing and the, um, the HVAC, if I can use all of those skills to build, 
my house. And if I can do that well, then maybe I become a developer. You know, like a custom point. home builder. Yeah, a custom home builder. Wow. Yeah. So well, I'm excited to see what the future holds for you. Well, thank you. It's very interesting to watch. Yes. It's very interesting to live in, actually. <laughs> very difficult. Any um, parting words for the entrepreneurs listening? Any par- parting words of advice? Or- yes. Yes, actually. Um, you, first of all, you know, you always hear don't give up. And that's the one thing I don't necessarily give up, but you have to be flexible and you have to cut um, things out or certain businesses, certain procedures or something out that isn't working for you. Um, you have to be objective, uh, and trust yourself. Don't trust necessarily anybody else, you know, trust, but verify. If someone tells you something, make sure you have it in writing all the time. If you're going into business with a friend or an acquaintance, okay. It seems like a, you know, oh, you guys are going to be great, but business is a completely different animal. It brings two different people out. The person you go into business is not the person that you were friends with before. It's the different person that you're dealing with. And so you should use, you know, contracts um, and uh, get everything in writing, get it all in writing, get everything in writing so that then the both of you have, you know, like good, good fences make good neighbors. You need to know when your behavior is starting to encroach on the fence of the other partner's behavior. And when you're friends and you don't have that, um, delineated very well, you're going to step on each other's toes. And now there's more at risk than just the business is going to be your friendship as well. Right. So that's really great advice. Well, thanks for coming. I really appreciate you taking your time on a Sunday. Well, and thanks for having me.